our online viewers, it's so wonderful that you're a part of our community if you're ever in our area. We just welcome you to come and take part in one of these services. We'll make you feel right at home. And just to start off with, I'd just like to ask you a quick question. I like to engage people by questioning. And uh, just, just have a question. Have you ever had any problems in life? Ever, ever had a problem, a situation? And, you know, it's not always fun to have problems, but imagine you get one or two of these problems and they mount up on each other. They start to, you know, start to you know, get on each other's backs and you have four or five problems. And all of a sudden, this thing is sort of coming at you from different angles. And you're like, this is crazy. And uh, just wouldn't it be wonderful if there was one solution to every problem? Wouldn't that be great? And a lot of times you hear the girls say, well, if I just had a man, that would be the answer to all my problems. Yeah, he is. He'll bring a few more with him. And so, <laughs> but he'll have, you know, he'll be some solutions, obviously. But what about the guy that says, well, I need a, I just got to have a woman and then everything will be wonderful. It's, yeah, it'll be, you'll have all your problems going in some areas, but she'll bring a whole bunch of others. And so, hey, look, at that's okay. And look at your, if I just had a baby, you know, if I just had a baby, I would just be, I'd just be fulfilled. Everything would be great. Yeah, but then there's diet. Well, if I, if I, you know, if I had, if I had a house, if I just owned my own house, absolutely, that would just be wonderful. But then you got, you know, you got land taxes, you got a whole bunch of different things, you, you know, stuff that can happen. So you, nothing just comes. Well, okay, but what if I, you know, if I just had a job, you got a boss. Well, if I owned the business, you got employees. There's so many things out there in life that comes around us, and we just got to understand if there was, wouldn't it be beautiful if there was one simple solution for everything? And I just love simple things. And just look at these simple solutions that have been designed. Have a think of the toothpick. So simple. Just a little piece of wood. But it's a solution, isn't it? Sometimes that little piece gets in there and you just got to get it. What about a can opener? Where are you when you're out camping and there's no can opener? You've got food there. You know, you've got a can opener. One of, toilet paper. We won't go any further on that one. Zippers. Man, without zippers, what, what would we do? And so elastic band, hair ties. You know, sometimes, you know, ladies, the wind, guys, the wind there. And you've just got to do the hair up. And so the wind, the, the elastic band, the elastic band, plastic bags. Man, what a great solution. That thing was, has been revolutionized. And, and so look at paper clip. Paper clips. We used to do some really cool things with paper clips and electrical outlets. We won't go any further with that. We won't talk about that any further. And so the ladder is one more solution that's so simple, but it can do so much. And so we, we want to talk a little bit about that, that there may be problems, but I do believe there is a simple solution for all things. And we're talking this year about Born for More. And I know there's times in life we say, there must be more than this. It just seems like problem or struggle or limitation or thing around me. No, but there is more. And so we're talking about that. And we believe we've been sharing a little bit of the solution, talking about the ladder. Maybe next week we'll talk about toothpicks. But this week we're on the ladder. And we're saying we talked briefly about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a long time ago. You a few thousand years ago, there was a man named Abraham, and he heard from God. And God shared in his heart to go to another land, and God would show him where he would build a nation. And then it's saying he got the promise, got the covenant, got the agreement, the relational agreement going, called the covenant. And then it went to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when Jacob was sleeping in the desert one night, he saw a dream of a ladder, and that ladder was reaching from earth to heaven. And that's it. Genesis 28, and we see that the, it was set up so that there would be a highway for heaven to meet earth. And then we get to the next situation. We see where in the New Testament, Jesus comes along and he says, it's no longer an agreement or some contract or some covenant. Now I am the ladder. Jesus becomes the ladder. He becomes, God is so personal. He didn't just have a written contract like the Old Testament. He sent his son, a person in the flesh, Mother Teresa, uh, Mother Mary, sorry, <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Mother Mary, the virgin birth, Jesus Christ came and was born born in the flesh, and that was God became human. How relevant is that? And there's my proof that you can wear modern clothing, because if Jesus put on relevance of flesh, we can put on modern, modern relevant clothing as well. And so he did that, and so I just want to encourage you that there's so much more. And so we look at this, and, and I just want to read a verse, and it says in, in John chapter 1, verse 51, the first time Jesus ever met one of his disciples, Nathaniel. Nathaniel was wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, hearing that Jesus was there, and then Jesus said these words to him. Very clearly, he said... 
from now on, you will see an open heaven. And what Jesus was referring to was now I'm not, it's not going to be a contract anymore between God and humans. It's going to be a personal relationship through me. Heaven is open for business. Don't you just hate it? You go to a place to get something to eat and it's closed. And my son Johnny was on a trip one time, and, and it was minus 40 degrees. And he thought, I just have to walk 20 minutes, and I can get to Superstore. It was closed. And then he said, well, if I go a little bit further, I'll get to Subway. And it was closed. He says, if I go another 15 minutes, I'll get to another one. And it was closed. So he had to walk home over an hour with an empty stomach back to the place where he was staying. And don't you hope when they're not open for business? Well, God said to Nathaniel through Jesus, heaven is open for humanity, the door is not closed. That makes me a little excited. And so we see this and we see, and he said, we jump back into this, from now on you will see an open heaven and gaze or look upon the Son of Man, Jesus, like a stairway. He's saying, you're going to look at me now, I'm Jesus. You're going to look on me as the highway. That word stairway in Greek is the same word used for ladder in Hebrew back in the Old Testament. And it literally talks about a wide highway built from earth, great foundations, reaching high into heaven. And the, the translator, I don't know if you've read the Passion Translation, put up your hand up on your line as well. That's a great modern translation of the Bible. It's just come out in the last few years. The main translator for that Bible, Dr. Brian Simmons, said this about that particular verse. Jesus Christ is that stairway, that ladder, that highway that joins earth to heaven and brings heaven to earth. So this whole plan that was all right from the beginning of creation, God was trying through a covenant, through a written agreement, through the Torah, through the principles, trying to set up through with Abraham a covenant to, so he could do good things, and good things happened to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But then Jesus came, and now through personal relationship, our marriages can get better. Our homes, our families, our children, business, life, uh, vocation, everything can get better because of Jesus. God is not into religion. That's why we don't have stained glass windows. No, it's because we bought a theater. And <laughs> but God's not into religion. He's into a relationship that helps things get better. If it doesn't get better, why do it? If it doesn't get better, if things don't get, you know, so and I'm, not gonna, I'm not cutting anyone down, but I'm saying it's got to get better. Proof that you're in the right thing is it should bring betterment to your life. Now let's jump into the next section. So we're talking today about how reaching up and reaching out. Reaching up with faith and reaching out with faith so that we can have the more that's in store. And I, I would just like to share a, a story from the Bible that's one of my favorite and one of the most you know, well-known well healing stories in the Bible. Blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, Bar Timaeus. And I'm going to start reading the story and sort of jump into it a little bit. And so it says here in Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 52. Then they came, Jesus and his entourage, his disciples. They came from Jericho. Jericho was the place where they knocked the walls down. Remember in, in Iron Man 1 when they had the Jericho missiles and you see the whole thing exploding in the desert? That was the system that they, that was what it was, the whole ref, reference was about. Jericho, the city, the walls came down. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. Look at this picture. He's sitting there by the roadside begging, reaching out to humans for human assistance. Human assistance is okay. But we have God. But he is human assistance. I need social security. I need, social st I need so all these services. People, people, people. And that's okay to some extent. But he is blind. And, he, and so he's there. And then it goes on. And it goes further. And it says he was sitting on the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout. He got a little excited now. He got a little bit more ang hungry. And, you know, I'm just thinking of a wonderful lady over here, Margaret. Margaret. Margaret's over 25. Margaret, can I say your age, Margaret? Okay, 33. Margaret's 
a little older than 33. She's in a nursing home. She had sugar diabetes. She was about to drop dead. This girl is excited about Jesus. I talked to her. I asked her if I could share this today. She said, yes, you can. No way. And she says, everyone knows that I'm a Christian in there because I'm so happy. But I don't go telling everybody. I don't go pushing. But they all know. They say, we know you're a Christian because she's so excited and happy. Well, she gets completely healed from sugar diabetes over a year ago, one year ago, got taken out of hospital. And I said to her now, I said, so how's it going? She says, I haven't had a pill for over a year. And I don't even watch, I don't even watch what I eat. And I go, oh, good for you, Margaret. Good for you. Now she, she says, I don't go overboard, but I still enjoy it. And so, so listen, this is the first thing. He's sitting on the road and, he's, and he's, he gets excited because Jesus, she gets excited about it. She's here in this young, crazy church on a Sunday. Give her a cheer. Give her a clap. What a woman. What a woman. She's excited. Didn't you know the first sign of a believer? They say, get excited about Jesus. They just say the word, and they're like, yes. Not crazy, but excited. And so that's the first thing that happened. I'm trying to show you what a faith person is all about. He was sitting there by the roadside, and when he heard Jesus of Nazareth, he was coming. Jesus, he shouted, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted even more. The second part is you don't listen when people say, be quiet. They try and put water on you. They try and shut you down. If you're living by faith, you're not being an idiot. You're not being a religious fruitcake. But you're still excited. You're still doing stuff. You're still living by faith. And people are trying to shut it down. Don't listen. He didn't listen. It said he got even louder. Anybody got a little bit louder? He got a little bit louder now. Get a little bit louder now. I was feeling you know, that, that good piano. Anyway, so... <laughs> I can hear a little bit louder now. And then many rebuked him. And he told, no, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped. Here's the next thing. The moment you get out from the crowd, you stop being a sheep. You stop following the culture. Cultural Christianity is religious bunk. <laughs> they just become one of these followers of the way of religion, getting to some cultural thing. No, know him for yourself. Have a real, so he got out of that culture. He got out and just cried out, Jesus, have mercy. Jesus stopped. Turn. Said to his disciples, go get the boy. <laughs> so it says here in the scripture, many rebuked him. Son of David, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Next thing, it says, he's throwing his cloak aside. We knew this from teaching before that I've given, is that that's beggar's garb, beggar's clothing, legal right, legal contract within this clothing that he's allowed. It's a particular color, particular style. He's allowed to sit on the side of the road and ask social security from people, getting people knees. He got up. He threw aside his security in humanity. He reached out to a living Savior. He knew he was excited. Jesus was there. He reached out, reached out to Jesus. And as the son of David, have mercy on me. Next thing, cheer up, throw the cloak aside. He jumped up on his feet and came to Jesus. He did something with what he had. He might have been blind, but he wasn't a cripple. He might have had a problem with his eyes, but he could move his legs. He could move his feet. He could move his arms. He might have got up. He might have bumped into a few people. He might have staggered, but they got him to Jesus. Listen, you might say, hey, I haven't got a husband. Well, you can do something. You've got legs. Take those legs to the gym. Do something. Get, get noticed a little bit. What about a guy? And then he says, oh, I haven't got a girl. Take those muscles, those arms to the gym. Or take your mind and get trained. Or go to work and keep a job. I'm picking on the guys now because the girls get upset if I talk about, about, about um, go to the gym. So I'm picking on the guys. And so and now go, go get a job. Be, be fiscally responsible. Now have you do something with your life. Women like security. Don't they, they like you have a little bit of money, a little security, and why don't you, while you're at it, guys, why work on your personality. Now, girls could do that too, but I'm picking on the guys. Work on your personality. Work on your people skills. Work on your reactions. Working on all these things. That's what we teach in church. That's what we teach, you know. So anyway, jump in. We've got quiet now. Come on, let's get a little louder now. Let's get a little louder now. Because he did something with what he had. He was a blind man, but he wasn't a cripple. What have you got that can take you closer to your miracle? See, God wants us to move. Yeah? When we start to act, that shows our faith. This guy the whole way through was a guy I don't have time to finish. 
but I'm going to be speaking on this stuff when we're over there at the Ten Crusade, and we're going to see so many people healed. We've seen people healed on Sundays, but you ain't seen nothing yet. We get in an environment where it's just exciting, and I can tell some crazy jokes, and we can have some fun, and everyone's excited. You can see God do some stuff, and we're going to have an amazing time. So anyway, Dr. Carmen is going to share with us how each one of us can reach up and reach out in faith. We can see God do something in our lives. God bless you today. today. Let's say reach up. Reach up. And reach out. Reach up and reach out in faith. And so I'm going to talk about this for a few moments this morning. Number one, reach up and reach out in faith through hearing the word. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says that faith comes from hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing hearing the word of God. And so we have to continually hear the right source in our life for faith to be built in our life. And so if we want to grow in faith, we have to feed on the word of God and we have to listen to the word of God. It will change our perspective. It will change the way we see things. It will change our belief systems on the inside of us. And can I tell you, people can be in church and not in church. True? Turn to the person beside you and say, occasionally that's been me. Okay? You can be in church and not be in church. You can be in church in your body, but not engaged to really hear what God is saying. And Jesus always left clues whenever he preached. There is the word that you hear, and then there are the clues that will be in the word that you hear. And if your ears are open and faith is arising, you will hear what God needs you to hear that will take you forward into something greater. The second one is that we need to reach up and reach out in faith by talking God's word. And Psalm 116 verse 10 and 11 says, Even when I'm, it seems that I'm surrounded by many liars and my own fears, and though I'm hurting or I'm suffering or I'm in trauma, I still stay faithful to God and I speak words of faith. So it says sometimes you're going to have liars around you. Sometimes you're going to have your own fears around you. It says sometimes you are hurting, and sometimes you're suffering, and sometimes there's some trauma around your life. And it says, but I'm going to stay faithful to God, and I will speak words of faith. If you will speak words of faith, you will speak yourself right out of that situation, right out of that suffering, right out of that chaos into the victory of God. And so faith takes its authority. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 says, We are ambassadors of the anointed one who carry the message of Christ to the world. Touch the person beside you and say, you are an ambassador. The Bible says you are an ambassador. And if you look in the footnotes there, it says to be an ambassador for Christ means that we are his diplomatic agents of the highest rank sent to represent King Jesus. And we have been authorized to speak on his behalf. We are the voice of heaven. Turn to the person on the other side of you and look at him and say, you are the voice of heaven. We are the voice of heaven to the earth invested with royal power through the name of Jesus and the authority of the blood of Jesus. So it says you are an ambassador, that you are an agent, that you have the highest rank, that you have been given authority to speak the words of Jesus, and it will change situations. And it says that this authority has been given to you. And when we walk in faith and we walk in authority, we can speak words and an atmosphere can change. We can speak words that bring freedom to people. We can speak words that change the dynamics of a situation. We can speak words that take something that would have taken a long time and it loses something so that it happens quickly. We have been given authority if we will use our mouth in faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14 to 15 says, For we first believe, and then we speak in faith. Yes, all these things work for your enrichment so that more of God's marvelous grace will spread to more and more people. See, God wants you to be a person who speaks in faith, who speaks life, who takes the word of God. And with authority, you already begin to speak over people that you know that are sick. Just when you're at home alone, you already begin to say they are healed in Jesus' name. You begin to speak the words of faith, the words of life over them. And I encourage you to already be speaking the words of faith over the tent meetings that are coming. The third one is that we reach up and we reach out in faith by loving our enemies. Faith gives us the power to love our enemies. 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 says, You're familiar with the old written law. Love your friend and its unwritten companion. Hate your enemy. But I'm challenging that. This is Jesus speaking. And I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with energies of prayer, for then you will be working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. And this is what God does. He gives his best. The sun to warm and the rain to nourish to everyone, regardless. The good, the bad, the nice, and everybody say the nasty. Right? That's what God says. He said, I'm giving my sunshine, I'm giving my rain to the good, the bad, the nice, and the nasty. Verse 48, it says, in a word, what I'm saying to you is grow up. Your kingdom subjects now live like it. Live out of your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously towards others the way that God lives towards you. And that word grow up in the Greek means whole, complete, fully mature, lacking nothing, all-inclusive, and well-rounded. God says, if you will reach up in faith, I will give you what you need to even be able to love your enemies. And I mean, know that there's a difference between somebody not liking you and someone wanting to destroy your life. There's a difference between that, right? There's a difference between somebody who says, you know, we don't really get along and somebody who's threatening your family. And yet God says, I will give you the power to be able to even love your enemies. And my pastor helped me through this when we went through a very challenging time of threats against our life. And my pastor, this is what she said to me. She said, Carmen... Everybody has a Judas. She said, you can't have a Peter and a Matthew and a John without a Judas. And she said, you do not get to skip the stages of Jesus just because you're Carmen. How many want to have a pastor like that, okay? And so she said, you don't get to skip the stages just because you're Carmen. She said, Jesus faced ultimate betrayal. And yet in the ultimate betrayal, he rose up and helped people. And so we have to realize that if we want the anointing of Jesus, then we will have some enemies. Then we will have a Judas. We will have people who will betray us. And yet God says he will empower us to even love the people who hate us. He will give us what we need at the time we need it to be able to do it. Faith empowers us to be able to love those who even hate us. The fourth one is that we need to reach up and reach out in faith with a spiritual family. The Bible calls the spiritual family your church. Colossians chapter 1 verse 25 says, But you must keep your faith steady and firm. We are to keep our faith steady and to keep our faith firm. And he said, I serve the church and God has appointed me to bring the complete word of God to you. God wants our faith to be steady. God wants our faith to be firm. And so many people are stuck in a rut because their life is too busy to hear the word of God. Their life is too busy to sit under the preached word of God and draw the nutrients and draw the nourishment that they need from the word of God to be able to go forward. And we have to reach up and recognize, God, you've given me a spiritual family. I was never meant to walk this walk alone. I was meant to be able to let some walls down around my life and let some people into my life who would stand with me, who would pray with me, who would walk with me through the journey, through the good times, through the bad times. You have given me a spiritual family. And we reach up and receive that, but then we also reach out and recognize that there's always room in the family for somebody else. Philippians chapter 1 verse 25 says, yes, I'm convinced of this so that I know I will stay in order to help you progress in the faith and have joy in it. God says, I'm putting people around you who will help you progress in your faith. And not just progress in your faith, but enjoy the journey. How many like to enjoy the journey, right? Progress in your faith and enjoy the journey. Hebrews 11, 20 says, the power of faith promised, prompted Isaac to impart a spiritual blessing, to impart a blessing to his sons, Jacob and Izu, concerning their prophetic destinies. It says that there was this power of faith enabled an impartation to happen from one person to another person. And impartation is the moment that you can receive, will receive freely what took somebody else years of time to fight the war to win. 
When you receive freely an impartation, you receive what somebody else battled for. You receive freely what somebody else went to war for. You receive freely what somebody else paid a price for. Impartation is when you receive freely from somebody what somebody else has paid a great cost for. And the scripture says the power of faith, it made an impartation possible. And there's been so many times in our life where we have had our pastors be able to impart something to us, something that we didn't earn, something that we didn't work for, something that was just simply a free gift. And we truly believe some things are more caught than taught, that there is an impartation of God. And if we will be open to the impartation of God, we can begin to walk into things that we were not, we never fought the battle to win that war. But God will give us an impartation that is so amazing that we can now walk in an area that is so much victory and such great victory for us. Number five, reach up and reach out in faith by drawing on overcoming power. Romans chapter 12, 11, never give up. Eagerly follow the Holy Spirit and serve the Lord. Let your hope make you glad. Be patient in times of trouble and never stop praying. And if you weren't here last week, I encourage you to go online and listen to the audio on on the power of prayer and how prayer can change your life. But it says, I want you to be patient in the times of trouble and never stop praying. I want you to understand that there is an overcoming power that is available to you if you will not give up. If you will learn to lift your hands in worship, if you'll learn to pray and not just rely on your own ability, there is an overcoming power that is available to you through faith. And you know, a few years ago, we went through some of the like the hardest time in our life. And I remember on Sunday mornings, and you know, we'd be in the worship here, and I'd be worshiping, and, and sometimes I'd just motion to the, the music team, like, just keep going. I'm not ready. I'm not ready to get up there. Just, just keep singing. And you're like, we sang that song this morning, like, I'm not enough unless you come. I, I don't have what it takes to, to do what needs to be done. I'm not enough, God, unless you come. And I just motioned them, just keep singing. Just keep singing, right? Just keep singing. And as, as they just kept singing, I would just draw on God's anointing. And I would say these words. I'd say, God, I have got nothing to give. But God, you've got something to give. And God, today I draw on the anointing that you have made available to my life. God, I stir up the gift of God that you have placed on my life. And God, I thank you that overcoming power is available. And in that toughest season of our life, that's when God taught me how to preach from my spirit instead of preach from my head. He said, like, I, I love to teach, and I love, but he taught me how to preach from the inside of me. And what God wants to do is stir up an overcoming power in you. That if it's in your business, if it's with your family, that it comes from the inside of you. It's not coming from your intellect. It's not coming from you rationalizing things. It's coming from deep down on the inside of you. It's called where your spirit rises up over circumstances. And so in the time of the toughest period of my life, God actually transformed me into something that was greater than what I could have ever imagined. It's called overcoming power. And so I never stopped preaching faith. I never stopped giving out. I didn't hang the towel and say, well, that's it. No, no. We recognize when trouble comes that we must learn to rise above our circumstances. We must learn to live above what we are facing in the natural today. And so as we do, this is the life of faith. And James chapter 1 verse 2 to 4 says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Turn to the person beside you and say, don't you just love that scripture? Right? You know, don't you just love that scripture? Right? Consider it an opportunity. I can't say that I'm quite there yet, right? That when trouble comes, I'm not just like, yippee yay right? But, but the scripture says, I want you to count it an opportunity for joy. It says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. And then as your endurance grows even stronger, it will release. I want you to say that with me this morning. It will release. That's the scripture says. It will release perfection. It will release perfection into every part of your being until there is nothing missing and nothing lacking. It says it will release it. Now that word perfection means whole, complete, fully mature, lacking nothing, nothing all-inclusive and well-rounded. The same word that we learned earlier today. 
It says, it will release something in you. In the midst of trouble, you're going up in faith, and you're coming out in faith, and it is releasing something through your life. And the Bible says it is perfect. It is well-rounded. It is whole. It is fully mature. It is lacking nothing. That is overcoming faith. Number six, reach up and reach out in faith by being mature and helping others. Romans chapter 15, verse 1. Now those who are mature in the faith can easily be recognized. They easily be recognized. Those who mature in the faith can easily be recognized. For they do not live to please themselves. But they have learned to patiently embrace others in their immaturity. Our goal must be to empower others. Touch the person beside you. Say, empower others. Our goal must be to empower others to do what is right and good and to bring them into spiritual maturity. So it says that we are now empowered to empower other people. And it says that it happens in the time when not everything is always perfect in our life. So in the midst of things not being perfect in our life, God will call us to empower other people. And I was thinking back in my life, and I remember, you know, several years back, we had a situation, and I got a phone call one day, and it's a phone call that I've had many different times in my life. It was the phone call of adoption. It was a phone call of like, you know, are you and Steve willing to take a child? Now, right at this particular time in our life, it was literally, I was going through the deepest pain I've ever been through in my life. In fact, I, if I was to make a label on it, and I'll probably share next week when we talk about the supernatural, I'll talk about that I was broken hearted. You know, the Bible says he will heal the broken heart. And I believe in the tent meetings, we're going to see some broken hearts healed. And I don't have time to talk about, I'll share my story with you next week. But I was in the deepest darkest place of my own personal life where I was walking through something that that I was broken hearted and the phone rings and says hey you know would you take another child would you take a child and have you ever been in the place where you thought I can't help anybody I need the help <laughs> touch the person beside you say I've been there okay so you know you think uh, uh, excuse me like I have nothing left to give I am broken hearted. I, I am empty. I, I'm, I'm, I am in the midst of going through hell. I'm not staying in hell. I'm just passing through. But I am. I'm definitely feeling the heat. I'm feeling the fire. I'm just passing through hell, right? And so I was in this situation. And you might think, well, my pastor goes through hell. Trust me, your pastor has been through hell. And she's back, okay? And so, I mean, that's, that's the way it works. And so and we're in this situation. The phone rings. And my oldest son, Jabit, comes into my room at just the right time. And he comes in and I'm having a bit of a cry. And I'm not a huge crier, but come on, everybody's got to have a cry sometimes, right? And so I'm having a cry and he comes, he's like, what's going on? And I said, I just got this phone call and, you know, they've asked us if we would take a child. And of course I'd asked him and he said, it's on you, baby. Like if you say yes, it's yes. If you say no, it's no, right? Like, you know, you got to make this call. And so I'm having a cry and I said, I cannot do it. I don't want to say no, but I said, I, I, I'm empty inside. I got nothing left to give. You know, I, I'm broken hearted and I'm having a bit of a whinge and a bit of a cry. And don't you like it when your child, the child becomes the teacher, you know, and, and they begin to, to tell you the words that you have said to them, right? And so he says, Mom, didn't you say that God had told you and Dad that, that you would adopt again this year? I said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, yeah. But God doesn't change his mind. He says, I don't think God has two personalities, two different voices, where he's like saying one thing and then, whoops, made a mistake, saying something else. He said, God doesn't change his mind. He said, don't you think that God knew that you would be going through hell right now when that phone call happened? Don't you think that God knew that you could be at the most broken part of your entire life at the midst of the time when the phone rang? And don't you think if he knew that ahead of time, that he knows that what you need is already on the inside of you to push through and do something that is great for somebody else? And I was like, shut up, you know? <laughs> I was just like, be quiet. You know, I don't want my kid teaching me, right? But, you know, the words he said changed my decision. Because at that moment, I began to realize that in the midst of your greatest trouble, 
God's going to speak to you about helping somebody else. In the midst of your greatest pain, it's not the time to have a pity party by yourself. It's the time to reach out to somebody else. In the midst when it doesn't look like something's working out in an area of your life and you feel disappointed, that is the moment that God is tapping your shoulder saying, look up to somebody else, look out to somebody else, begin to reach out in faith. And so the scripture tells us in, in Romans chapter 15 verse 2 that we should all be concerned about our neighbor and the good things that will build his faith. It's that there's other people and we have the ability to build their faith. And so the greatest time for you to reach out to others is when you are having trouble yourself. The greatest time for you to reach out to others is when you are having trouble yourself. Touch the person beside you and say, it looks like it's my time right now. It looks like it's my time right now to reach out to somebody else. The greatest time for you to reach out to somebody else is when you are in trouble yourself. Romans 15 verse 2 in the message says, for strength is for service not status. Strength is for service, not status. Strength isn't just so we can look good. Strength isn't just so that we can be in a position and say, look at me. No, no, no. Strength is for service. And sometimes we got to dig in deep and get the strength we, de we need. It's called overcoming power when we begin to think about other people. And I'll close with this verse today, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18 says, no, no, no wonder then that we don't give up. For even though our outer person gradually wears out, our inner being is being renewed every single day. If we keep going up in faith every single day, our inner being is being renewed. We just keep reaching out to God every day. We're being renewed on the inside. We're being strengthened on the inside. We're learning how to be an overcomer on the inside. We just keep reaching up in faith. We are, we are getting what we need. We're drawing on the power source of God. We're drawing on the strength of God every single day. We are being renewed every single day. And so we view our slight, short-lived troubles in light of eternity. Turn to the person beside you and say, your trouble is short-lived. It says it's just a short-lived trouble. Whatever you're experiencing today, this too shall pass. That it won't be here long. It's just short-lived. It's not going to linger around you for the rest of your life. It's just some short-lived trouble. So we view it in sight of eternity, of the life of someone else. Because we don't focus on our attention on what is seen but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. So that faith is being mature enough to know in the midst of my situation, God is going to flow through my life to touch somebody else's eternity. In the midst of my trouble, God is going to flow through my life and change the direction of somebody else's eternity. And that's what I want to pray for you for today. If you can close your eyes and bow your heads. Those of you who are watching with us online, we're going to pray together as a community of faith right now. And as we do that, we encourage you to speak the words out loud with your mouth and to agree with us. And we believe that as we pray that something is going to happen and, and be transformed inside of your heart, inside of your life. As we simply take this time, these few moments to, to give God the opportunity to move on our hearts in a great way. And so this morning, I'm going to ask two questions. The first one this morning is if you've never given your life to Jesus. Pastor Steve said blind Bartimaeus was there. He said, Jesus. He just called out on the name, you know, the name that's above all names, the name that's greater. And he said, Jesus, come to me. Jesus, have mercy on me. And if you're in the place this morning that you've never made that call, you've never dialed the name of Jesus. The Bible says that when we do it, he gives us a new beginning, a new start, that, that things begin to rearrange on the inside of us. The Bible says we are born again. We get a brand new beginning, a brand new start at life. Why? Because of the name of Jesus. And so this morning, if you've never called on that name, I want to encourage you today is the day to make that call. Today's the name say, Jesus. Or if you're in the place today that you say, I've made that call. I've asked Jesus to be the leader in my life. But maybe you're in a situation today and, you know, you've just been 
thinking about yourself, thinking about what you want and being kind of self-consumed. And God said, I want you to reach up in faith. I want you to take it for yourself. But don't stop there. I want you to now begin to think about other people. I want, I want to flow through your life to minister to other people. I want to flow through your life to empower other people. And so if you're in the place today that you think, God, I want that in my life. God, I don't want to just be looking at my own trouble, looking at my own circumstance, looking at my own dilemma, looking at, God says, it's short-lived. This is so temporary. This is, this is nothing compared to eternity. Sometimes we get so focused on one little thing in the natural, and God says, lift your eyes to something that is greater. And so this morning, if you need to lift your eyes to something that's greater, lift your eyes off your troubles, off your circumstance, off your dilemma, and say, God, I give you permission to flow through my life, to touch somebody else. Maybe you're going to invite people to the tent meetings. Maybe you're going to have to drive there with your car. You're going to pick them up. Maybe you're, you're beginning to pray and speak words of faith and words of life this week over those meetings, over those people you're inviting. Let God flow through you. You say, I'm consumed with my stuff. Well, today, you let that go and you say, God, I want to be consumed with your stuff. God, I want to be consumed with eternity. And so this morning, if either of those of you and no one looking around for a moment, I want you to just give me a hand up and a hand down. I want to know who I'm praying for today. If that's you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Fantastic, fantastic, thank you. Thank you. You can place your hands down. Anybody else that you need to do that today? Okay, thank you. Fantastic, fantastic. I want to encourage every person to pray this prayer with me today and say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Today, Jesus, I open the door of my life and I invite you, Jesus, to be the leader in my life. I thank you that today all things are new in Jesus' name. And God, today, I thank you. I reach up in faith and I receive fresh strength. I receive overcoming power. And God, today, I receive the anointing to reach out to other people. God, I thank you that as I reach, God, you will show yourself strong every time. In Jesus' name. God bless you today.